Now it's time to talk about the collaboration booth at Storm Audio and Grimani Systems. I feel very honored to welcome these two gentlemen in our YouTube channel. First of all, this is um, Sebastian Gaeton, head of uh, technical support and at Storm Audio. You were included in the introduction of RB22. This is Anthony Grimani, the living legend, the former leading THX engineer and now you have your own speaker brand for a couple of years. And I have to admit that it's, it's such a pleasure experiencing the demo you're showing up here. It is top of the notch in terms of the acoustical performance. It's not that well presented in terms of the whole package, the room itself, but when it comes to the sheer audio and visual quality, it's outstanding. It's especially in the precision of the lower frequencies and the dynamics. The dynamics have blown me away, especially. And um, that's the first digital, the fully dr uh, digital driven theater at Cedia. Uh, what impact was it for you to design this home theater based on AES67? Or is it not important at all? Is it more I'm, about I'm, the speakers? I'm going to mention a few things. It's multiple elements. I'm going to drop my bottle of water sure. because I need to use my hands. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Just speak to the microphone. Yeah, speak to the microphone. So there's several impacts. Mm -hmm. uh, there is. I guess a few levels of theoretical impact and there's a level of practical impact. So first on the theoretical impact, what we're doing is a signal from the source, which is in this case a kaleidoscape, is coming out, all the digital audio is going into the storm decoder, getting decoded, right? So there's a, there's a bit stream that's turned back into the 23 channels we're playing in here. And then its output is coming out digital through networked audio, mm -hmm. through one digital cable, uh, it's in the rack back there, going to a distribution through a network switch, an ordinary network switch, staying in digital and going directly digital into the power amps. Then the signal is getting treated for room correction and for filtering to the tweeter mid-range woofer. Um, our speakers are all active. It's a power amp that drives each one of the drivers. There's no passive crossovers in the speakers. It's all done digitally. So benefit number one is this, the signal is staying digital all the way through to the end which is theoretically better, instead of going through an analog conversion and some cables and then more processing and maybe another analog to digital, digital to analog, we're just, we're just keeping the stream all digital, so that's one benefit. How much worse do you think would the performance be with a regular analog version of your process? I know that's a tricky question. Well, you would certainly lose around 10 to 12 dB SNR easily by just cascading different processing. And, and that becomes a problem because in a room like this where you have 23 speakers and subwoofers, the, the background noise of one speaker plus the other becomes a huge background. So you need to make sure that you you, you keep the, the noise of the NEM as low as possible. And that's, yeah. really good. And that's the beauty of going fully digital. The, one of the other reasons, having one, one cable that provides all the channels to the amps, mm -hmm. we can go into very specific processing and pitching and fire. Okay. And the number of channels that is required is quite high. So actually, even though the processor, we are able to do 32 channel, here we require how many channels in total? We're doing 23, oh. 23 channels. Yeah, total. but with the multi ways, with all the ways. Oh, uh, with all the ways, I, I can't even count. We don't make the math, but <laughs> this is more than uh, uh, 50. Uh, Probably, uh, no, more, 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 more. Uh, probably like 75, there's probably 75 channels of amplification going on in there, because there's a separate channel for each driver, mm -hmm. and the noise would accumulate. So Sebastian mentioned the word SNR, that's because he's an engineer, I'm also an engineer, but what, what he's saying is noise floor. Yes. Yeah. So what happens when you do an analog to digital conversion, and a digital to analog conversion, there's, an, there's a, there's two possibilities of gathering noise. First, the conversion loses a little a little bit of dynamic range. But worse than that, this is the part that people don't, don't follow, is um, you're also running an analog cable out of one product and into the next. In the middle of a rack, it has all this noise. Mm -hmm. And that noise is picked up. Mm -hmm. I know you're running a balanced line. It is shielded, but it still picks up a little bit of noise. And one channel wouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. 23 channels matters a lot. It so you consider AS67 as a new standard and a very common practice for future home theaters, especially when they become very big right. in size? Right. It's, it's, a, it's a okay. new practice, I would say. So okay. I want to be clear that it's not a new standard, and there's a reason oh, I'm yeah. saying this. Yeah. People are afraid of things that are no, too new, because you may get sure. stuck in... But it's something that gets more accessible right now with the in, process. In, in our space, but yeah. in, in the pro space, it's been there for a very long time. Yeah. 
Sure. That's but the point. It's, it's, in it's scope years. of regular home theaters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the AES, AES is Audio mm -hmm. Engineering Society. Yeah. The audio, the engineers in the Audio Engineering Society came up with this standard ten years ago mm -hmm. as an initial offering to the industry, going, "Hey, here's a way to get all of our audio into a network." It's been adopted slowly and progressively in commercial and pro audio, and now we're bringing it into the residential, high-end residential space to improve the quality. Yeah, okay. The, the main reason of the benefit of AS67 versus the other is that this is the standard that they agreed on for interoperability. So we, you, you can guarantee when you go into an AS67 network that you can have a good communication with many different protocols. I mean, okay. the biggest one right now being Dante, they have a layer of compatibility. Okay. Before talking about direct ART, I don't want to spend your time too much. Yeah. Um, can you just show us um, the rack and how it's built? Yeah. Let's go so, over so there. Let's go look yeah, at the sure. right. How did Direc ART, or you call it ART, affect the planning of this home theater? Or does it affect, on which way does it affect the planning of future home theaters? Do you think that's important for a perfectly built home theater or just being usable for living rooms where you have to get the best out of the situation. Yeah, let, me, let, me ad let me address that and support him. It's always, it's always good for the other person okay. to get praises, right? So ART allows to do processing uh, to essentially get around acoustical issues inherent with a room. So you got to understand that the best speaker in the world, the minute you put it in a room, the room's going to change the sound of the speaker the same way know, that yeah. this is changing it. It's very underrated from it's, many customers. Uh, it, half of the sound quality comes from the yeah, room. Yeah. So you can have the best speakers. If you're not dealing with the room acoustics in some way, some way, uh, you're only getting half of your, of your money. Yeah. Now, there are a few ways to do it. Way number one is to treat is to design the room correctly, have the right proportions, right locations, and treat the surfaces with the right acoustical materials. And the right is a certain amount of absorbers, certain amount of diffusers, a certain amount of base traps, base absorbers, all located strategically. That's what we do in dedicated rooms, whether it's a studio or a private home cinema, where we treat all that very carefully. And then there's rooms where you can't do that because they are a multi-use living room, for example, into which you've, you've put spaces, or there's some design, interior design looks and styles, mm -hmm. like maybe you have an apartment with beautiful windows on the downtown, yeah. you're not gonna put acoustic treatments. So now, the other thing you can do is through digital processing, you, you can change how the waves are going around the room to reduce the audible impact of the acoustics of the room. Ideally, you do both. And in this room, we did both. We have both acoustical, uh, what's sometimes known as mechanical acoustical things. So an acoustical panels and processing to, to finesse it. Yes. But with things like uh, Dirac ART, you can go into a room that has no acoustics and make it sound good. But would you use it in an in a almost perfect environment? We did. Okay. We did here. Okay. So well, I'll, I'll let, yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the idea is that, I mean, the active room treatment actually it's something that really helps below 150 hertz. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why, as, as, as Anthony mentioned, it's, it's still a good practice, mm -hmm. and it has to remain, that you, you need to treat your room for the frequencies above to make sure that you, you get a good, a good decay time control. But the benefit of Indeed Art is that it can say, save a lot of effort in the low frequency. Mm -hmm. I mean, the complexity is not as big as you start using the active room treatment, in room where you cannot install big bass trap as, as mentioned, well, it does a lot. It does really okay. help a lot. What was the decay time you were able to achieve in this particular room below 100 hertz? So, the the, the more important than the decay time is the smoothness of decay. Yes. Time. Mm -hmm. When everything is done, right now this room is about 0.25 seconds okay. from 8 kilohertz, which is the highest my measuring system can do, all the way down to 30 hertz. Did you something like to same. make it slower? Yes. A room this size. Uh, which is about a 85 or 90 cubic meters mm. should have a decay time of about 0.25 to 0.28. Mm -hmm. So we're a little bit on the slightly lower side of that, just a little bit. Um, it, but more important again than exact Unif value is uniformity. Sure, yeah. Why? Because if it's not uniform, sounds that go into the room, some of them stay longer mm. and some of them yeah. go away faster. So this room is nice and smooth. Um, we actually let the low frequency rise up a little bit because that just sounds and feels better. If, if you have it all flat, the bass feels a little anechoic. Yeah. It's more analytical, but it just does, it's not as enjoyable. So it rises up, 
I don't exactly remember the number, but ultimately, I guess from the view of your screen, it starts with the highest frequencies, it's really smooth, rises up a little bit at the low end, and it's very well controlled. Yeah. And it's quite important to level it with the decay in the mids and the heights as well. Yeah, so sure. it has to match, otherwise the sound match. gets unnatural. Right. So uh, let's get back to the hardware. So, the hardware. Um, so, so basically, this, this is Sebastian's Yes, indeed. Subject. <laughs> so let's not touch it, by the way. They are demo running right now. Yeah. So we have the processor here and all the amplifiers in the bottom. Mm -hmm. So as you can see in the middle, you have the switch and it takes... And this is just a regular Ethernet switch. In that case, yeah. no multi-link. I think it's it is a, a gigabit right. It's a gigabit switch. But it's, it's not. It's a, not but it's not a very not a special managed, audio file switch, switch no. something and like it that. It is not managed. And these are common uh, Ethernet cables. Standard yes. standard yeah. Cat6 Ethernet cables. Yes. This this is the this is the audio feed from the storm decoder right there. Yeah. Here we have the control, I think, and here the uh, the different. Uh, thing. Mm -hmm. But they share the same network. Okay. So uh, there are no let's say stringent requirements to look at uh, an expensive network management in small systems. When you have multiple rooms, multiple zones, you need to start looking at managing it mm -hmm. you know, with quality of service or different things. But in a system like that, where actually there is only the, the audio and the control of a small system, it's fine, no problem. So that's not complicated in that sense mm -hmm. and it does not require specific management. But the beauty is that then you can really have a proper connection to all your amplifiers and then work with all the processing within the amps. Do you like to add anything? So to the, the rule of thumb that I'm hearing out there is when you go over 20 or 25 devices, you want to start to be more careful with the network switch. Maybe separate the audio stream from the control. Mm -hmm. Maybe manage the switch so that it uh, so that it just is more under control. But in a system like this, no, no worries. One final concluding question to both of you gentlemen. Sure. What is your thought of a home theater in five years, building up with a LED wall? How does it look like? Will it be acoustically room treated? And um, how do you integrate a center speaker? That's so a I'll, lot I'll of I'll questions. That. Actually, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's quite probable that the world is going to switch from projection to LED walls. Not entirely though. Yeah. We've, we've had a number of clients that have looked at both choices on their own with their eyeballs and go, I like the projector better. So the projector does mean that you got to control the light in the room. That's the only inconvenience. Yes. Yeah. The projector does mean you can put a screen like in this room that's acoustically transparent, a Seymour screen, excellent yeah. screen, and you can hide all the speakers. You can yeah. good current with the sun. So, but I, I do think that the convenience of, of an LED wall is, is fantastic, right? So yeah. how do you deal with the audio? Uh, we have a technology within, within our product line that we call reflectance, where we do this. Put the pair of speakers on the edge of, of mm -hmm. the LED wall for the left, left and right. And for the center, we have a, a, a special version of our waveguide that gets put on the ceiling and beams sound to the screen surface okay. and reflects it back to the listener. Don't you think this will collide with um, Oro 3D height channels as they come from the same angle? Yeah, so that's a good question. Not not so because the signal is no. coming from over your head, but not going down to you. Yeah. Okay. It goes, uh, so it's the angle that it's, it's really angle. reflected it's by the screen. screen. So if it was me and you were the screen, okay. there's a waveguide up there that's focusing sound to the screen and reflecting off the screen. Mm -hmm. Now it's not broad. It's not broad frequency sound. You can't do that. Otherwise, the speaker would be too big. It's from the upper mids to the highest frequencies, so the waveguide's about this big. Mm -hmm. You can hide it in the ceiling, you can put it in a box and just soft it, whatever. Um, below about 800 hertz, we redistribute that sound to the left and right speaker, so it's a phantom center below 800 hertz. Mm -hmm. But your ear believes that the sound is coming from, yeah. from the okay. screen, from where you are. Now, okay. the, the top channels, uh, usually, usually Dolby Atmos these days, are, are aimed directly at you. Sure, makes sense. Um, so it you, you no have signals. Yeah. Now, now the, the sound waves, you could go, well, they're all intersecting each other. That, that, that's not that's not a problem. Their waves yeah. can be going down that way to the screen, the other one's directly to you. But you still works. get many reflections from the screen, from all the surround speakers. So basically, I think that acoustic transparent screens will be um, in advance compared to yeah. LED walls when it comes to acoustic. For, yeah, for better coherence of the sounds yeah. you know, with right. the sound to picture, it's, it's still better. going to be quite hard to, to get something that competes with this. Uh, it will be an interesting future. I consider this exhibition to be a step change as 
LED walls become more and more affordable. Oh, definitely. And uh, it you know, so it being able to watch game in some clearly, I mean, being able to watch movies, TV, or whatever, at, with with full window open, etc. I mean, right. people want that. I mean, we understand this requirement. Okay, right. but so it's but, all about. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I mean, but there there are there are solutions. Clearly, I mean, yeah. this solution from Anthony. Uh, I mean, at, at Star Audio, we're working on something that will allow to create a phantom image with different speakers. Okay. So we have to come with solutions so because there's more to come LED yet. LED panel are part of the game now. Yeah. We need to consider that. Whether we like it or not is a matter of taste. I think you get people who like to have the, the speakers behind the screen and a lot yeah. of them. It, it's a matter of the best compromise. Yeah. All, all engineering efforts are compromised. Yeah. It could be money, weight, speed, color, whatever the compromise is, okay. you know, in, in anything you're doing, whether you're building a rocket, a car, or a theater. For yeah. some clients, the right picture solution is an LED wall. For other clients, the right solution yeah. is yeah. a projector. Yeah. I think we have to, to think flexible. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah you got to adapt to the, to the use case from the yeah. client. For May I just ask just one simple last question? Yes. What do you think about your own demo? And what do you like to add to this conversation? Do you consider this... Um, performance as top of the notch from your experience I give my answer first yeah considering the time we had to make it happen it's a great demo yeah, yeah. yeah. Can, can we do better certainly that, In, that's true yeah. so considering we really only had two two and a half days to set it all up and tuning the first day was just building this and then uh, we had very little time and, and the result is amazing given the very little yeah. time a nice. sometimes joke they were sort of here camping you know we're yeah. here temporarily um, so that's one thing we had really little time the other thing is the the noise around us this the street yeah. show has an average noise of 82 decibels yeah. just outside you go into this room it does reduce the noise but not enough to hear the quality yeah. So when I listen to this demo at seven o'clock in the morning before the show opens, I'm like, wow, this sounds amazing. Mm. And then at 9, 30, 10 o'clock, when all of the noise goes, like, ah, yeah. it's just about noise floor. And that's a lesson to anybody who's building a, a listening environment, that you got to control the noise so you can yeah. hear the dynamic range. We started talking about signal to noise ratio yeah. and worrying about the noise floor over yeah. here. The BNC, well, if yeah. the room is noisy, it doesn't matter. That's a very underrated uh, factor. And, and, and that's why to go back to the RP22 document, I mean, this is a document that, that tries to bring all the things you have to think about when you design a theater. It gives recommendation, but at least you have a guideline, an idea yeah. of what you should look for. And the noise floor is part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And the light and everything is, is part of all the considerations you have to do. I mean, that's the beauty of that thing. And the home cinema is a, is a not conjunction, but it's a, a synthesis of many, many different parameters that you have to take into account. So and that's a lovely thing. Perfect. I take that as a conclusion. I thank you so much for the, your time. Actually, You're welcome. It was You're welcome. great with you. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs> Bye.